Good evening, everyone. I hope that you are keeping well and I hope that you are staying safe and maintaining your social distancing rules. And I trust that uh, you are also able to have some contact with other people, whether that be through phone calls uh, or other ways of contacting people. Uh, I trust tonight that as we return back to our series on John, as we begin to finish up on the book of John, we don't have long to go, that these final few passages that we will deal with uh, will be helpful to you in your walk with the Lord. Let's pray together and ask that God help us before we read from his word. Our Father, we thank you for the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world. It is difficult for us at one level to really appreciate all that he has accomplished, all that he went through, all that he endured, so that we as rebels are able to be reconciled to you, are able to find a way back to you. We thank you that he becomes the bridge back to you. And we thank you that when we trust in him and when we turn to him and when we turn away from our sin, that you promise to not only give us eternal life, but you promise one day to take us to be with you where we will be forever. And we thank you that this is all because of the reality of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. This evening, as we spend some time examining your word, we pray that you would open our eyes. We pray that you would show us the wonder of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would magnify your name for Jesus sake amen I'm going to read from John uh, chapter 19 and I'm going to pick it up uh, at verse 28 I'm going to pick it up at verse 28 we are only going to look at verse 30 this evening so just bear with me later Knowing that all was now completed and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We're going to focus on that phrase, it is finished. If I can begin by relating a true story that happened in Uganda back in 1973 on the 10th of February uh, in Kabale. People were commanded to come to the stadium and witness the execution. This is being related by a bishop in the area who was called to go and uh, minister to these men who were going to be executed. Death permeated the atmosphere. A silent crowd of about 3,000 was there to watch. I had permission from the authorities to speak to the men before they died, and two of my fellow ministers were there with me. They brought the men in a truck and unloaded them. They were handcuffed and their feet were chained. The firing squads stood at attention. As we walked into the center of the stadium, I was wondering what to say. How do you give the gospel to doomed men who are probably seething with rage? We approached them from behind. And as they turned to look at us, what a sight. Their faces were all alight with an unmistakable glow and radiance. Before we could say anything, one of them burst out, Bishop, thank you for coming. I wanted to tell you, the day I was arrested in my prison cell, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. He came in and he has forgiven me of all my sins. Heaven is now open and there is nothing between me and my God. Please tell my wife and children that I'm going to be with Jesus. Ask them to accept him into their lives as I did. The other two men told similar stories, excitedly raising their hands, which rattled their handcuffs. I felt that what I needed to do was talk to the soldiers, not to the condemned. 
So I translated what the men had said into the language the soldiers understood. The military men were standing there with guns cocked and bewilderment on their faces. They were so dumbfounded that they forgot to put the hoods over the men's faces. The three faced the firing squad standing close together. They looked toward the people and began to wave handcuffs and all. The people waved back. Then the shots were fired and the three were with Jesus. We stood in front of them, our own hearts throbbing with joy, mingled with tears. It was a day never to be forgotten. Though dead men, the men spoke loudly to all of Kizai district, southwest Uganda and beyond, so that there was an upsurge of life in Christ, which challenges death and defies it. This was Bishop Festo Kivangari that related these events back in 1973. Death is something that all of us ultimately are going to face. It's not a pleasant subject to talk about. But what enables a group of men who are about to lose their lives to be able to confidently stare the executioners with a steady eye, knowing that they are about to be shot and have joy and wave to the crowd and have their faces beaming. It is because their confidence lies beyond the grave. It's not that death has a hold over them. They are not afraid to expire in this world, for they know that death in this world is entrance, is life into the world to come. And they know that with certainty, because there's one who has paid the penalty for their sin. There is one who has died as their substitute. There is one who has experienced what they deserve and they so richly deserve. He has experienced all of that on their behalf so that when they do die, they can know with absolute confidence they will go directly into the presence of God. That is their confidence. That is their joy. And it is precisely because when Jesus stares up towards heaven just before he bows his head and he dies, he utters these significant words, it is finished. And the question I want to ask this evening is what is finished? What does Jesus mean by that statement? It's pregnant with meaning. Firstly, come to me, come with me as we look at the text. Number one, his suffering was finished. His suffering was finished. Now, there are a number of ways in which Jesus suffered when he was here on the earth. Firstly, he suffered at the hands of men. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. They opposed him. They made life difficult for him. They questioned him. They made false accusations against him. Isaiah 53 reads as follows. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Matthew eleven nineteen says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Matthew twelve fourteen. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. He suffered at the hands of men and ultimately was falsely accused by the Pharisees and Sadducees, put on trumped-up charges, condemned to death by the Romans and the Roman governor Pilate. And ultimately the crowd who joined in and bade for his blood, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And ended up on that cross, beaten, marred, struck with men who hated him, whipped to almost within a breath of his life. A crown of thorns 
plunged onto his head, pressed in, nails driven into his hands, driven into his feet, suffering on that cross at the hands of men. That suffering was coming to an end. He suffered at the hands of Satan, secondly. He suffered at the hands of Satan. Satan did everything he could do to disrupt Jesus. Satan did everything he could do to try and force Jesus to sin. Because if Satan could have got Jesus to sin, then none of us could have been saved. If Jesus had fallen prey to temptation, then he would have become like us, a sinner. And he couldn't have gone to the cross on our behalf. And Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, I won't read the account for the sake of time, details the temptations that Jesus faced. And when we read that text, I know I've said this to you before if you come to this church, you must understand that those temptations are not just three isolated incidences of temptations, but rather those three temptations are repeated again and again and again. And they are repeated ad nauseum that Satan would try and trip him up and try and tempt him to sin so that he could then triumph over Christ. That suffering at the hands of Satan was coming to an end. Third, he suffered physically. He suffered physically on the cross. He suffered physically when he was beaten. He was taken after he was condemned to death, as we know. He was taken by the guards. They stripped him. They had whips, the vibratio whip that had uh, pieces of lead on it with hooks coming out. And they whipped him until the blood was flowing. He suffered physically on the cross excruciating pain. Every time he tried to take a breath, he would have to try and push up on his legs on the cross to draw in air and then exhale and draw in and exhale until eventually the energy was so sapped from him he could do it no longer and finally dies of asphyxiation. His suffering physically was done. Fourthly, he suffered the agony of being abandoned by friends. How sad it is that in his greatest moment of need, at the point at which he could have done with some support from his friends, those he had spent three years with, those whom he had discipled, those whom he had counseled, those whom had drawn into deep relationship with him, whom he had slept on the side of the road with, whom he had given advice, whom he had taught, all of them, without exception, abandon him when he is arrested. Listen to the word of God that speaks to us in Matthew 26, verse 56. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. His friends left him to do that alone. His desertion, his abandonment from his friends was at an end. His suffering, uh, number five, was also taking upon himself the sin of the world. The burden of taking upon every single sin that every single person who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ has committed, he takes upon himself, he bears the weight of their sin. Every action, every thought, every wrong attitude, every behavior, every flaw, Jesus suffers the weight of the sin of the world upon his shoulders on that cross. And that suffering was excruciating because Jesus goes to the cross as one who has never sinned. He has never experienced sin in his life. He has never succumbed to sin. He has never given in to temptation. Now the sin of all those who will trust in him are suddenly thrust upon him. And for the first time, he experiences what it's like to have to deal with sin. You know what it's like. 
and experiences. The first time you experience certain things, there's always a, it can be a shock factor to it. I remember in the, doing national service where we had to do a 120 kilometer uh, walk with our full kit over four days, with, uh, over five days with one rest day. It turned out to be about 160 k's and we were in a mountainous area and we were doing about 40 k's a day with our full kit. And some of the guys at the end of day one and day two, their feet were covered with blisters. I'll never forget it. And the medicos would come and they would get a syringe and they would draw out of those blisters the water that was uh, in the blister and in its place they had this medication that you can't get in Australia. I have some in my cabinet because I've brought it back from South Africa. It's called methylate. It is a combination of mercurochrome and alcohol and it's a a reddish color, reddish orange color and they would take this and they would inject it in and replace the water where the blister had been. And the first time I experienced that, I nearly hit the groove. It was burnt like crazy because the alcohol part was burning up all the rubbish and ensuring that there would be no infection as a result of that. And I saw some grown men with tears running down their face because of the pain of that medication. If you don't think it's painful, go and speak to my son, Michael, because I've used it on him when he's had grazers and he was hopping around the one time as we put methylate on him. But once you've experienced that once, the next time you experience it, you are prepared. You know what it's going to be like. And so you steal yourself mentally. You prepare yourself and you know that there's going to be a sharp burst of pain. And then after a few seconds, that pain will decrease until it eventually dissipates. But the first time, there's a shock factor. And for Jesus, this is the first time he experiences the weight of sin. Unimaginable pain. And that moment of experiencing sin is the agony of the cross. That suffering was over. Finally, He pays the penalty. Number six, he suffered the agony of being forsaken. He is forsaken by God the Father. We hear that and I've said this so often of the agony of that cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the expression of the agony of having the eternal fellowship between the Father and the Son at some level, in some sense, broken was agony beyond what you and I can imagine. There is agony when we lose a loved one in this world, whether it be a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a husband, a wife, a friend, a cousin, an uncle, an aunt. You know that when you love someone deeply and they die, you know the pain and the sense of no longer being able to have fellowship with that person, no longer being able to talk to them no longer being able to enjoy their company. Now imagine the closest of relationships that has been an eternal relationship and this relationship suddenly for the very first time has broken and the fellowship that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit enjoy together is now broken in that moment when the sin of the world is placed upon the shoulders of Jesus because God cannot look upon his Son when the sin is put upon him and he turns his face away. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those words are so precious and I'll tell you why. Jesus is forsaken so that you and I, when we die, don't have to be forsaken that we might enjoy the eternal presence of God because he was forsaken. That suffering was done. He suffered finally the wrath of God as God pours out his eternal wrath on the Son. 
He suffers that because the sin of the world has been placed upon him. And God's justice must be satisfied. God cannot turn a blind eye to sin. He cannot pretend it's insignificant. He cannot simply ignore it. He must have his holiness satisfied. And the only way his justice can be satisfied and the only way that we can be reconciled back to God is if someone stands in our place and someone experiences what you and I deserve and that is the full measure of God's wrath. And the son experiences that. Unimaginable wrath. So that one day, for all those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't have to experience the full measure of God's wrath forever in hell. He endures that so that I don't have to endure it, so that you don't have to endure it. If you will turn away from your sin, if you will trust in him, if you will put your hand in the hand of the master, then you can know with absolute certainty that when you leave this world, you will experience the eternal presence of God and be spared from the eternal pit of hell where those who go there will experience forever the full measure of God's wrath. How do we process that? What a savior. He doesn't have to endure that. He doesn't have to experience that suffering in a sense of being forced to. He does it voluntarily. He doesn't do it because God the Father is twisting his arm. He doesn't do it because he's being beaten to do it. He does it voluntarily. He comes into this world as God the Father sends him as our gift to us as human beings in order that the love of God which reaches out to us might find its fulfillment in Jesus Christ being sacrificed on our behalf that we might experience that love forever. Jesus goes to the cross not because he is condemned to death by Pilate. He remains in control from start to finish. But because it's the only way that he can win your salvation and he can win my salvation. And he willingly suffers. That suffering now is finished. It's done. It's over. And he suffers so that you and I one day don't have to suffer. Secondly, his mission was finished. His mission was finished. What is his mission? Jesus states it in a number of different places uh, in the Gospels. It's not that it's just put in one particular place but there are a number of scriptures that Jesus talks about and fundamentally Jesus says that he has come into the world in order that he might save sinners let me read some scriptures for you just to see that I am not making this up John 1 29 John as he's ministering sees Jesus walking towards him and he points to him and he says Look, the Lamb of God, who does what? Who takes away the sin of the world. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on that last day. Or Luke 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man came to do what? To seek and save the lost. Matthew 1.21 she will give a birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Or 
If you go forward from the Gospels to the Epistles, uh, to Paul's letter to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 15, what does Paul write under the inspiration of God's Spirit? Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. It is made abundantly clear. Jesus is sent into the world to save sinners. Why? Because you and I cannot save ourselves. Oh, I know that we think we can. I know that there are many in the world that somehow think that as long as we perform in a certain way, as long as we behave in a certain way, as long as we live according to a certain ethic, as long as we do the right kinds of things, as long as we try and be good most of the time, even though we don't get it right all of the time, as long as we go to church, as long as we say a few prayers here and there, as, as long as we open the Bible occasionally, as long as we follow all these kinds of of rules and we try and be as consistent as we're able, well, that's enough. Because when I die one day and I end up having to face God, because he's such a benign and loving and good and gracious God, which he is, of course, he will just say to me, look, you can come into heaven because you're a good person and you deserve to be in heaven and so welcome in. And so they live complacently. They live in a way that doesn't take into account what God himself has declared in his word. And what has God declared in his word? We are told in Romans chapter 3 verses 12, uh, 10 to 12, There is no one who is righteous. No, not one. What is? is the standard that you and I must maintain if we are ever going to get into heaven. It is the standard of perfection. What does that look like? It means, my dear friends, That in every thought, in every word, in every attitude, in every behavior, in every action, we must be one 100% directed towards glorifying God, to lifting up His name, to showing His greatness, to living in perfect and absolute obedience to Him. That's the criteria. And the reason why it's impossible for any human being ever to maintain that standard is because we are born with a corrupted nature. Why are we born with a corrupted nature? We are born with a corrupted nature because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and rebelled against God, they passed on that nature that was once perfect in God's presence that had now become corrupted. They passed it on to all their descendants. And since every single human being ultimately descends from Adam and Eve, all of us are corrupted when we are born by sin. And there is nothing that you and I can do about that because that nature directs our every action. That nature causes us to act in rebellion against God. We declare UDI against God, unilateral declaration of independence. In the 11th of November, 1965, The then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, Rhodesia cabinet met together and they made a statement as a country declaring unilateral uh, declaration of independence against Britain. They came out from underneath the Commonwealth, underneath the rule of Britain, and they became a sovereign state. We have done that With God, we have taken charge of our own lives. We have allowed us to become the center of our being. We have allowed us to act the way that we want to act. We do the things that we want to do. We allow our self-centeredness to rise to the surface and our actions are conditioned upon what we are by nature. And you can't change that. You can't take what is corrupted and make it uncorrupted. It's impossible. 
The only way that that can change is through the supernatural work of God upon a person who takes what is corrupted and kills it. He puts it to death. And thus we enter into the death of Christ. Our old person, the old me, dies, which is exactly why Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Jesus gives us new birth by creating a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And only when Jesus has done a supernatural work of grace are you and I saved, saved from what? Saved from our corruption, saved from our sin. And when that occurs in us, when the heart is changed, it inevitably brings us to the point of repentance where we understand, recognize, acknowledge that we are rebels against God and we turn away from our rebellion because of the work of the Spirit in us and we turn towards Christ and now instead of being rebels because God has done a work of grace in our lives, we become saints. We are turned from sinners to saints. And we begin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, being renewed in him, being created in him, finding life in him. That's his mission. And in order for Jesus to be able to provide that means by which you and I can be saved, saved from our corruption, saved from our rebellion, he must do what you and I cannot do. He must fulfill the law's demands. He must live his life so that every single moment of every single day is lived to the glory of God the Father. That's why he says, I've come down to do your will, not my own. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he agonizes over what lies ahead, and he prays and he says to his Father, is there any other way? He ultimately says, not my will, but yours be done. He obeys God perfectly. He is born as the second Adam, as the second person with the uncorrupted nature, hence the nature of his birth being born of a virgin. It's supernatural. It's conceived by the Holy Spirit, thereby alerting us to the fact that this man is different to everyone else. He's not born with a corrupted nature. He's born with a perfect nature. He is perfect. And thus, he never yields to temptation. He never succumbs. He never disobeys God the Father. He lives perfectly before him. And thus, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, if I may read it to you, says, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And that work of living perfectly before God, that work is now finished. And as he breathes out his last breath, he has accomplished what he set out to do, to save sinners, to rescue them from the fires of hell, to deliver them from the clutches of Satan, to provide a way back to God, he becomes the bridge that takes us over the river to God. And it is Jesus himself who declares, therefore, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. His work is finished. His death completes his mission. And when he expires on that cross and when he breathes his last, he has finally secured the salvation of all who trust in him. Have you trusted in him? Have you turned towards him? Have you put away the filthy rags of your own good works? Have you set aside your own goodness? 
Have you recognized that you can never live to the standard which God requires if you are going to make it into heaven? It's impossible. Have you turned your face towards heaven? Have you looked to the cross? Have you bowed before the cross, before at the feet of Jesus? And there have you cast off the burden of sin that weighs us down so terribly? Have you let it go as Pilgrim did in Pilgrim's Progress when he got to the cross and the burden was finally released? Have you done that? Have you trusted Christ? Have you given your life over to him? Or have you spurned his work on the cross? If you have done that, let me say to you with absolute assurance, you will enter into the resurrection life of Jesus Christ one day. Because in the same way that Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be raised from the dead. It is a fact. It's going to happen. Death has no hold over you whatsoever. Thus, like Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, you can stare death in the face and you can say, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives me the victory. His mission was complete, finished. And then finally, his triumph was finished. His triumph was finished. What do I mean by that? Well, there are three ways in which this comes out. Firstly, his triumph over sin. He conquers sin. He defeats sin. He breaks the power of sin. He breaks the tyranny of sin so that those who are enslaved to sin, those whose every action is born out of sin, he breaks that power. He breaks it completely. He smashes it and he enables us to come out from the power of sin that rules our lives and he enables us to live in a different way according to the Spirit of God who comes to dwell in us, who empowers us and who enables us to live a life that reflects the glory of God. He breaks the power of sin. See, that's the truth of the matter. Every person outside of Christ is still under that power of sin who still continues to behave in a way that is consistent with that sin, who is a slave to sin. Jesus comes along and he breaks that power and he rescues us from its tyranny. You see, that's why for the Christian, my dear friends, there's a sense in which it's impossible to sin. It's not that we don't sin, of course we do, but we don't live there. Because that power and that tyranny that sin had over our lives, that's gone, that's broken, that's smashed, it's done, it's dusted. Now we live according to the Spirit. Now we live according to the new man, the new person that God has created. Now we have a power that is outside of ourselves that enables us to live in this way, the power of the Spirit. Now we don't live according to the flesh. We live according to the Spirit, you see. And we are freed. The Son sets you free. You are free indeed. There is freedom from sin in Christ because he triumphed over it on the cross. Second, he triumphed over death. He triumphed over death. How do I know that? Well, because his death is not the end of the story. 
What happens three days later when the women go to the tomb and they go and seek out the body of Christ that they may lay perfume on that body. They arrive. The stone covering the tomb is rolled away. They walk in. The tomb is empty. Angels appear and they say, he's not here. He's risen. He's alive. God has raised him from the dead because it's God's way of putting his seal of approval on the effectiveness of the death of his son in securing the salvation of all who turn and trust in him. Now death cannot hold him. Now he defeats the power of death. He smashes it. He breaks it. And he liberates us from that power that we fear so much about dying in this world. Yes, physical death is coming. None of us are going to escape it. That is one of the consequences of our rebellion against God. And we are not going to somehow get out of dying in this world. The death rate is still one per person. But what we are spared from is the second death. And the second death that Scripture speaks about is the death that all who are in rebellion against Christ, all who reject Christ, will experience for all eternity as they suffer the wrath and the absence of all that is good about God in hell. That's the second death. That's the terror of the second death. But Jesus has defeated it. He's been raised. He's alive. And Paul says, in the same way that Christ Jesus has been raised from the dead, all who are in Christ will follow and they too will be raised from the dead and we will live again. Hallelujah. What a Savior. He breaks the power of death. And then thirdly, he triumphs over Satan. He crushes the power of Satan so that as Paul writes through the Colossians, he is able to say, and let me read this to you, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He triumphs over Satan. He breaks his power. He breaks his tyranny. And he enables all those who are now under his power to come out from under Satan. And Satan loses any power he might have had over those who are in Christ. He is a defeated foe. Oh, he may have a big bark. He may look fearsome at times and we are told he is like a roaring lion but when he opens his mouth and he roars there's no teeth because God has stripped him of his power. Do you remember in the book of Job and then I'm done in the book of Job where Satan comes into the presence of God you remember he points out Job and says consider your servant Job uh, let's afflict him and let's see if he still worships you and then in Revelation, we're told that the lightning star falls from heaven and that symbolizes the fact that Satan no longer has access into the presence of God because on the cross, Jesus Christ defeated him. He has no power of the Christian. Zero, zip. You don't have to bow to him anymore. Do you see, Christian, when you start acting in ways that are inconsistent with your nature, and when you allow the old nature to rise to the surface, the one that has been put to death, and you uh, feed that nature, you are acting in a way that is contrary to what you are, to what God has made you. And you don't have to bow down to Satan anymore. You don't have to jump to his every woman fan fancy. God, God has defeated him in Christ. Now live in the power of the Spirit who enables us to live in a way that glorifies God. And because he has triumphed over sin, death, and Satan, all those who trust in him enter into that triumph. We share that victory, or rather, he shares that victory with us. Let me ask you, do you know that victory? Have you experienced that triumph? Have you experienced the power of sin being shattered? 
Have you come under, out from the umbrella of Satan and under the umbrella of Christ? Do you know that you know that you know you have life eternal? His triumph is finished. Now let me ask you, do you know this Jesus? Have you turned to him? Have you accepted his offer of grace and turned away from your rebellion against him? Oh, don't resist him. Don't shun him. Don't ignore him. Don't trust in your own merits. Turn to him. Cast yourself on him. He is merciful and he's waiting with open arms. Come, he says, come. Will you come? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the work of Christ that is finished. Oh, we are so grateful. Because of his finished work, we can be reconciled to you. For all those who have been reconciled to you, encourage them, I pray. Strengthen them, I pray. Help them to truly understand who they are in Christ. And for those who don't know you, you know who they are, Lord. Those who have never really trusted Christ, maybe they're fooling themselves. Perhaps they're self-deceived. Oh God, reach down and rescue them that they too may enjoy the benefits of the finished work of Jesus. For his sake. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.